Amen. I said I was excited to uh, gather with you guys today uh, because this is uh, our season of Advent. Um, And in Advent, it means coming or arrival. What we're doing is we are celebrating, in a sense, the the first coming of Jesus Christ. We're looking forward to the day that we celebrate his birth. Uh, It's not necessarily the exact date of Jesus' birth, December 25th, but it's the day that we've set aside to remember and to, to think on, to celebrate the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, into this world. And we also look forward to the second coming of Christ and where where God is ultimately going to redeem and restore all things uh, back to the way he ultimately created them to be. And so we have much to celebrate during this season as we observe a season of Advent. Now, I, I was going to give you an illustration today uh, that, that talked about, uh, you know, knowing whether or not your faith is sincere or knowing whether or not it's really a real faith or whether you have something that's, that's a counterfeit. And, and I, you know, I actually, my, my brother-in-law, Justin, he was browsing Facebook and thinking about his family, which is a really nice thing to do. He was doing this in advance. And Y'all remember the starter jackets from like 1990? You know what I'm talking about? The big starter jacket, NFL logo, you can get your favorite team and all that. Well, Justin just happened to browse upon one of these and he thinks, man, my son Grady is going to love this. And so Justin's a big Raider fan and he, he finds this jacket. And he, he orders it. It's, it's a Raider jacket. Again, NFL logo, the whole thing. We're living back in the 90s, you know, like celebrating those things. And so he's ordering this for his son and he gets it. And uh, he totally got ripped off, y'all. It's like a counterfeit from China. I don't really know. The, the, it's like paper thin. It feels like a trash bag, you know. And uh, the NFL logo, it's kind of like sloppily printed. It's not like stitched or woven. He, he totally got ripped off. And, and in this season, I, I would say this to you. If we're not careful, we'll get ripped off too. In this season, if we're not careful to think on what it is really about, the true significance of Christmas, the the fact that Jesus Christ is ultimately going to come again, we are going to get ripped off. We're going to miss out on what is truly rich and what is truly valuable during this time for us. And so it's not just true during Christmas, though. I mean, in the midst of our lives, it's so easy to get distracted. Uh, I've got uh, my seventh grade son. He's playing basketball with the school now, and we travel a lot. Right, so we might drive to Shakota, and we got to be there at four thirty or five o'clock, and to try to get my kids off the bus and to get to Shakota and watch the basketball game. And we stay and watch my nephew play. It, it, late nights, lots going on, and it's true for all of us. But wouldn't it be sad if those of us who live in this time, in this this season, where we get to look back to the cross of Jesus Christ? the defining moment in all of history. We get to look back and we see how profound that is and what God has done for us. And we know the the reality of the gospel for our lives. If we live between the cross and the second coming of Jesus Christ, wouldn't it be a shame if we missed out on living the fullness because we got distracted by some secondary issues in our lives. It's not, listen, there's nothing wrong with, with basketball or, or you know, being present with your kids or working your job or doing the things that we do. But wouldn't it be a shame to miss that, which is most important? We're going to see in Luke chapter 3 today, John the Baptist, he comes as the first prophet to have spoken in 400 years. And he begins to speak a message to the people that says, hey, you need to pay attention. You need to prepare yourself. Something big is ultimately coming. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 1. Now, um, Luke is said to be a, a doctor. Uh, we, we find that uh, basically in the New Testament, it's, it's pretty well uh, held among most scholars. But he was a very detailed guy, and he wants to be very specific for us about the, the specific events that he's talking about. And so if you want to know where and when Luke is writing about the specific time frame, frame, he gives us a great deal of clarity. If you want to go back and research historically, you can know about all of these people. You can place them in history. And so in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Now in the 15th year uh, of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, go look him up, right, if you want to know when this is, that was basically AD 27 to 28, somewhere in there. Most scholars would say that's when this happened. 
When Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, and Herod was the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Itcherea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was the tetrarch of Abilene. If you want to know where, like when this took place, it was this specific time. Again, go look it up historically. It was during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, who, by the way, happened to be the son of Zacharias, and he was out in the wilderness. And so this man, John the Baptist, he's out in the wilderness during this particular period. He was uh, around the Jordan River. There was a, kind of a, a broader wilderness that people, um, well, you, you didn't normally hang out there. It was kind of rare. So John the Baptist was a unique guy. He wore clothing of camel's hair. He ate locusts and honey, and he lived in the wilderness. But for whatever reason, God sent John the Baptist to this place at this time, and he had a very specific message for these people. And they, they can't wait to go here what the first prophet to speak in 400 years has to say. His name is John, and they were all astonished. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong uh, section here. I'm sorry. And he came into the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this is an interesting thing that's happening uh, uh, with John telling all the people that they need a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. This was not a, a common thing for people. Like, we know baptism today, Right? We understand it. In the New Testament church, you get saved and you get baptized. That's what you're supposed to do. But that wasn't always the case. Baptism at this point was only reserved for people who were not ethnic Jews, who weren't raised in Judaism, but converted to Judaism. And so if you were a Gentile, uh, uh, you were a Greek, or you were you know, from some other nation, and you decided you want to convert to Judaism, you would be baptized to identify with the Jewish people. Like, hey, I'm, I'm going to live as a Jew now, right? Those were the only people that, that got baptized, the outsiders. Those who didn't belong, they now uh, would be baptized to show their belonging. But then this new prophet, John the Baptist, he shows up in the wilderness and he's preaching to all the people, you need a new baptism. You may not belong and you need to belong. And this baptism is one of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And this is a totally new message because the Jewish people, they had known the law. And they knew that every year you have the Day of Atonement and, you know, a blood sacrifice would be offered for your sins of the year. Like they, they knew about this, the sacrifices that would be made. They knew what the law said. But suddenly, here comes John, this strange man wearing camel's hair out in the wilderness. He eats strange things and he's preaching a strange message. And he begins to quote the prophet Isaiah to the people. He says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, that's John the Baptist, by the way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, and he's saying, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight. The rough roads will become smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. Now, this, this is an analogy given for normal preparations that would be made for royalty. Maybe think about it like this. Uh, if you're having family over, uh, uh, ladies, if your mom is coming for Christmas, um, you're about to scrub the house down, right? You don't want it to look messy for your mom or maybe for guests that you don't know. Or maybe you could just think about if the president of the United States was going to come dine with you over the holidays, you might do a little better job of getting some things ready for them, right? I mean, you don't want to burn the food. You don't want your house to be messy. You might get some scented candles, you know. You want a little bit of ambiance. You want to look like you have it together. You would scrub the baseboards, and you haven't done it all year. We know it. None of us have either, right? You would do the things that you haven't done in quite a while because you want to make preparation for this very important person who is coming. Now, as John the Baptist is, is quoting the prophet Isaiah here, and he, he says, make ready the way of the Lord. It's, it's the preparations that you would make when a royal guest was coming to your city or to your home. And he, he tells them to do some pretty interesting things. And you can kind of think about this, right? Uh, you know, back, back in, the, in the first century, there was a little bit of pomp and circumstance, right? When royalty came into town, they would often come, you know, uh, they would have, be escorted by riders on horses. They would adorn themselves to show that they were indeed royalty. And so in preparation for their coming, 
The prophet Isaiah, being quoted here by John the Baptist, make ready the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Clean up your kitchen, right? I mean, you make some preparations for the royal visitor who's coming. Every ravine will be filled and every filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and all roads will be smooth. And again, all of this that the prophet John the Baptist, he's speaking out in the wilderness and he's speaking to the Jewish people and he's telling them, you need to get ready. And this must have been an exciting thing for them to hear because the Jewish people had been looking forward to the coming Messiah. They must have been excited to hear about what was ultimately happening like God is coming in the flesh. The Redeemer is ultimately going to be here. And they knew that this meant the forgiveness of sins. And he says here, all flesh will see the salvation of God. And I bet they thought, like, I can't wait to see him. Man, I can't wait to see what he's going to look like when, when, when Jesus comes in the flesh. And he, you know, they kind of thought he was going to take over this worldly uh, place where he would be a worldly, earthly king and he's going to establish a kingdom. Uh, he was doing something far different when he came. But there must have been a sense of anticipation and excitement about this coming king. However, <clears throat> John is telling him to do something here. To make some level of preparation, and yet, this is clearly an analogy. He's not really telling them to straighten out their roads, right? He's not really telling them to fill in the ravines or to lower the mountains and the hills or make the crooked paths straight. There's a different sort of preparation that John the Baptist was telling them that they needed to make in anticipation of the arrival of the Messiah. What were the crooked paths that needed to be made straight? Or the mountains that needed to be lowered? What were the ravines that needed to be filled in? Now, just just for the record, I I went to school in Stillwater, and it's a pretty different place from here. Um, We live in eastern Oklahoma. Y'all know about the crooked roads, right? I mean, we don't have a lot of mountains, but we do have the world's highest hill, and we're pretty darn proud of it, right? And so when you think about roads, you don't always go straight. You know, there's like big objects in the way at times. There's hills and mountains and rivers and lakes. And so, you know, where there's a big obstacle in the way, you, you go around it. When, when I was in Stillwater, um, everything is pretty much like north and south and east and west. And, you know, every mile you go out, especially into western Oklahoma, uh, you have section line roads and all that. It's really easy to get where you're going. But around here, we don't get a lot of those straight roads, right? And the reason that they're not straight is because there's big and movable objects in the way. So how are we supposed to make straight the paths? How do we fill in ravines and lower the hills and do all that? That's immovable things. How are we supposed to move these seemingly immovable objects? Or what are these things in our life? Well, John is using an analogy here, quoting the prophet Isaiah, talking about the coming of the Messiah and the preparations that we should make in anticipation of his coming. And he's not talking about Cavanaugh Hill or the Poto River, right? He's not talking about the roads that we have around here. Um, What he's talking about are the sinful tendencies of our hearts. Matter of fact, if you look back up in verse 3, the message that he's preaching is a message of baptism, of repentance. And what he's telling them they need to do in preparation for the coming of the Lord is to examine their hearts. What are the crooked paths that they've been taking? What are those immovable things in their lives, the, the mountains of sin or the deeply entrenched sinful tendencies of their life that they needed to address in preparation for meeting God in the flesh? You need to be ready because God is coming. And the way that you prepare yourself to meet God isn't an outward physical sense, but it's something that happens inwardly. It's internal. And the message that John the Baptist preached to the people was one of repentance. And so if you're unfamiliar with what repentance is, it's actually two things. The the first part of repentance is acknowledgement of your sin. 
Now, we live in a day and age where uh, we're not super enthusiastic about acknowledging our sin. We don't enjoy it whatsoever, as a matter of fact. Uh, I don't know if, if you're married here today. Uh, usually there's one spouse in the relationship that's a little better about owning their stuff, and the other one's like, I ain't apologizing. Not going to do it. Can't do it. I'm not going to admit it when I've messed up. And, and more and more, I believe that that's so in our culture, where we don't want to acknowledge our sin. We don't want to think of ourselves as messed up or that we're broken, or that we can't control our lives in some way. And so the, the tendency in our culture now is to say, no, 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 I haven't sinned. The tendency in our culture today is to define our own truth, right? The tendency for us is to say, well, um, I know maybe what the Bible said, but it doesn't really mean that today, right? That was just a cultural thing, right? But when we think about what biblical, genuine biblical repentance is, is acknowledging God and His standard. This is uh, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you want to know whether or not your life is full of sin, if you want to know whether or not you're missing the mark, don't look at the people around you. Don't look at other cultures. Don't look at how you feel about things or what other people are saying. You look at God, who was perfect in every single way, perfect in holiness, perfect in his justice, perfect in his righteousness. And so as we look toward God and his holiness and his perfection, his righteousness, and then we look at ourselves, we see that we have indeed sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so repentance on the front end, the first part is acknowledging that we are sinful and that we've blown it, that we've made mistakes. We just call it out like, I, God, I've sinned. There's a sorrow that comes in recognizing that our sin, it doesn't just affect us, but it, it affects the people around us. That we think about the things in the world that we hate. Maybe it's suffering or maybe it's injustice. And we realize that every time we sin, we have contributed to the very things that we hate. We're a part of the problem. We're not necessarily part of the solution. And so on the front end of repentance, it's just acknowledging, I have sinned. God, I've done it. I've missed the mark. I've fallen short of your glory. But the second part of repentance isn't just acknowledging that we've sinned, but it's turning away from that sin, and instead it's turning toward God. You might think of it like this. Um, You've been walking a path, and you're going the wrong way. You're walking the crooked path, the path of sin. When we repent, we realize, not only do we realize that we're going the wrong way, we turn and we instead begin to walk the path of obedience to Jesus Christ. We obey God with our lives. The call of John here in telling the people, hey, the Savior of the world is coming here in the flesh, God in flesh. He's going to be among you. He's going to make his dwelling among us. Prepare the way. Make ready the, your, your life. Make ready the path of, of God. And listen, it's not a physical path, but rather it's your heart's. And you need to prepare yourself to be in the presence of the Savior. And listen, if John the Baptist would say it to them for the first coming of God, how much more important is it for us to make ready ourselves to prepare for the second coming of our Savior? Like The interesting thing is the people that are hearing here, they haven't heard a prophet speak in 400 years. They didn't see Jesus in the flesh yet. They hadn't seen the cross. They hadn't seen love displayed as Jesus endured suffering on our behalf. Like they didn't know the gospel like you and I know the gospel. They didn't have the hope at this point that you and I had. They didn't understand as fully as you and I understand. And yet they were called to make ready. How much more having known who God is, how much he loves us, how good he is, how much he cares for us. How much more should we prepare ourselves for the coming of of the Lord when he comes back once again. If the call to repent came to those people then, why not for us now? So we acknowledge our sin. We acknowledge our failures before God. And we turn and we begin to follow after him. But lest you think that repentance is, okay, 
I've got to figure out where I'm messing up and I'm, you know, kind of blowing the whole deal and I need to do better. And then I've got to figure out how to, you know, begin to walk the right path. Uh, here's, here's the beauty of this. Repentance is a gift from God that he gives to his people. We wouldn't be content in our sin anymore to walk the path of destruction, but instead that we would have the opportunity to walk the path of life. And so repentance is not self-effort. It's not self-help. We ultimately look to God for repentance. We look to God for that transformation to happen in our hearts. And here's here's what this looks like. Y'all read the Bible and it is like, it is just littered with people who blew it in big and ugly ways. I'm, I'm currently reading in Exodus, and Moses, who was going to be the guy that was going to lead the nation of Israel out of the slavery in Egypt, he was going to be like the guy, the one who was going to meet with God on the mountaintop. Moses' career basically starts with murdering somebody. And he's like, God, wait a minute, I'm not sure I'm your guy. I'm not sure I'm the one that's supposed to lead your people because I've blown it in a huge way. And yet God, in his grace and in his mercy, he uses a guy like Moses, the King David who slew Goliath and was like the most heralded king in the nation of Israel. Slept with a woman who wasn't his wife. Murdered her husband to try to cover it up. What we see throughout Scripture is that it is littered with men and women just like you and I who have blown it in big ways and in small ways and everything in between. And then we see these little phrases throughout the Bible. David blew it. You and I, we've blown it. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. But then this phrase, but God, who is rich in mercy and because of his great love for us, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. Here's the beauty of this story that as I talk to you about repentance today, God is the one who leads us and empowers us to repent of our sin and to walk in the, the good path, the fruitful path in this life. And so this could be something that we celebrate. As a matter of fact, Martin Luther, you know the 95 theses that he, that he posted on the church, uh, the Wittenberg Church in Germany. Y'all, y'all know this, right? It's about the church and, and penance and some of the corruptions that were happening in, in the, the Catholic church back then. You know what the first of the theses said? He said that repentance, and this should be the ongoing thing in the life of a believer, that that's what we've been called to as the people of God. We're not good in and of ourselves, but we happen to serve a good God. And what ought to happen over and over and over throughout our lives is that we absolutely blow it. Now, that's not what should happen. That's what does happen, right? We blow it, and then our gracious God, we turn to Him. Away from our sin, we turn to God, and He is the one who restores us. He's the one who heals us. He's the one who sets us back on the right path. And that is the goodness of God for us. I don't know what your life looks like right now. Like I don't know where you are in relation to maybe, uh, maybe you don't even trust God at this point. Maybe you've just been doing life exactly the way you thought you should, the best that you could for your entire life. Maybe you've never followed God. But maybe today God is beginning to speak to your heart. Maybe you've stopped maybe looking in the mirror or looking at the people around you, but you've seen the goodness and the glory of God who spoke all that we know and see into existence. He created the world, who's perfect in all of his ways. And you realize, man, I'm not that. I may not be a terrible person compared to everyone around me, but, but I don't meet the standard of the glory of God. And maybe today you're realizing that you need to repent. Just acknowledge your sin before God, and you cry out to him to save you, to rescue you, and help you walk that path of abundance. And maybe you've been a believer for 30 years. Over the last few days or weeks or months or maybe even years, you kind of become enamored with the stuff of this world. And rather than pursuing God and walking in his path, you've just been going your own way. The call to you is to repent. John the Baptist, the prophet of God, has some really strong words for the people. After pointing out that they needed to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Lord, he says this in verse 7. He began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him. Now, these were, these were good religious people, right? I mean, this is a prophet of God. He says, I need a baptism of repentance. I'm going to go get that, right? And, you know, check the box off. We're going to do the things that we're supposed to do. But he, he says, man, this, this phrase, 
It's weighty. He says, you brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, you're going to see in just a second, he's speaking specifically about the nation of Israel. They were God's chosen people. They were the ones who were keeping the law. They were the ones that were converting other people to their Judaism, right? Their way of life to following after God. They were the people of God. And yet he says to them who were hearing this, you brood of vipers. You know, a viper is a snake, right? He's like, do you know whose offspring you are? It's not the offspring of God. Remember the, the way Satan came in the garden? He was a snake. It's like, your, your children of Satan, you brood of vipers. And then he tells them something and in, in, in kind of asking this question, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? He's telling that wrath is coming, that they're on the path toward experiencing the wrath of God rather than His grace. It's a tragic thing. Y'all, it happened with the nation of Israel, and I, I'm concerned for us that it may happen with our, in our midst. The men and women who believe that they know God, they believe that they've, they've been baptized They've been to church and they've done the things, but, but they haven't experienced this genuine transformation where they have come to see that God is higher than all other things, that God is, the, is all good, that He is perfect, that He is full of glory, that He is the one to be sought. And so everything else kind of melts away in our lives as we see the goodness of God that he is worth pursuing above every other thing. The tragedy here is that they were living extraordinarily, exquisitely focused lives, practicing the law. But they were children of Satan, and they were headed toward wrath. And so God sends his prophet to his people. He says, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? In verse 8, he says, Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And it's not enough for you to get baptized in water. Your life will tell the story of the genuineness of your repentance. And you ought to be able to look at your life and say, You know, am I not? Listen, we're not going to be perfect, right? It's not that I mess up yesterday. It's not that I, even that I blow it this morning, but, but is my life becoming conformed to the image of Jesus Christ? Is the fruit that's being produced, not, not just outwardly, but even those inward thoughts, that inward dialogue that you have, is it becoming increasingly conformed to the image of God? Am I starting to look like Jesus as I follow him on the path, or am I walking another one? Bear fruit. In keeping with repentance. Don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. The, the ethnic Jews, they, they like to trace their lineage from their father Abraham, the one that God made a covenant with and said, hey, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my people and I'm going I'm to multiply you and make you into a great nation. You're my chosen people. You're going to exemplify me to the whole world. And they would look back and say, oh yeah, Abraham's our father, so I'm, I'm good with God, right? He's like, don't, don't trust in that for a second. Don't, don't trust in the time that you got dunked in the water. Don't trust in your religious observation. And you look at the fruit of your life. You look at what's going on in your heart. Are you being transformed? Don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children for Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, so that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is another analogy. This is another metaphor for the people. Uh, they would have understood it in the same way that many of us would now. Uh, you got a fruit tree that's not producing. You, you cut it down and you replace it with one that will, Right? He's urging the people to take a look at their lives. Is the gospel beginning to bear fruit in you? Here's the good news for you. That though you were dead in your trespasses and sins, 
the things of your past that you might be ashamed of, maybe the things of your present that you're ashamed of. Though we were dead in our trespasses and sins, we have been made alive together with Christ, and we have an opportunity to live out the abundant life in Christ Jesus here, not longing for and chasing after the empty things of this world that will never satisfy our souls, but we have the opportunity to be satisfied by our Creator God Himself, satisfied by the Creator where creation could never satisfy us. And it begins to transform us day after day after day after day. As we begin to walk the path of Jesus Christ, our lives begin to bear good fruit He's the way and the truth and the life. If we follow him on the way, live out the truth, we find the life in him. We live it in him. And so the question for us today, across community church, the people of God, when was the last time that you repented of your sin? When was the last time you experienced godly sorrow over sinning against a holy God, over the destruction that your sin has caused. When was the last time you wept over your sin? You acknowledged that before God and you turned and you began to follow Him. We think about where we are in the story. We've seen the cross and we're looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And day after day, our pattern should be one of repentance. We're imperfect people following a perfect God. We know the truth. We don't always live the truth. And it's through this pattern of examination and repentance that we prepare ourselves for the second coming. That we know that when Jesus comes again, the second coming of Jesus Christ happens, we're ready. We've been walking with Him, following Him along the way. There's a a parable that Jesus tells us about the, the, the Word of God and how it takes effect in our lives. And he, he talks about four types of soils. And he, he, the first type of soil, he says, it's, it's, the, it's the seed is sown on a path. It's really hard. It's well-worn, packed in really well. And so the seed sown on that path, it, it doesn't ever spring up. As a matter of fact, birds just come and eat it because it doesn't ever take root, doesn't do anything. Then there's the second type of soil. Um, it's kind of rocky. And so the, the, the seed, it, it begins to germinate, begins to grow a little bit, put down some roots, but it's really rocky, and there's, it can't get into all of the soil. And it's, it's so shallow that um, it just can't stand the test of time, and so it withers and it goes away. And there's a third type of soil that's perfect. It's got all the nutrients. It's not so rocky. The trouble is that it's just crowded. It's the seed sown among thorns. So many other things there that the Word of God can't take root and begin to bear fruit. He says the fourth type of soil. It's the one that's ready to receive the word. And the seed that's planted there, it bears fruit 30, 60, or 120 times what was, was sown there. As we think about our repentance, maybe we could think about our hearts in that way. Maybe you've heard the gospel sown into your life, and you've heard the message of the gospel that you're a sinner who's in desperate need of a Savior, and God made the word become flesh. Jesus Christ came to save you from your sin, that by coming to faith in Him and not trusting yourself or your good deeds, but trusting in Jesus, um, your life too could begin to bear fruit. You could be saved and live out the abundant life. Maybe that's for you today. The message is one of salvation, and this is the day that you surrender your life to Jesus. And maybe for you, and you've heard the word before, you're a believer in Him, but the soil of your heart's kind of rocky. Honestly, your faith is pretty shallow. It's like, God, I'll give you my Sunday, but I got the rest of the week. Everything else is hard. God, you can't go to this part of my life. God, don't ask me to be faithful to you with my sexuality. God, don't ask me to be faithful in my finances. God, don't ask me to be faithful in my business dealings or my interactions with other people. God, it's my speech. I'm not so good. God, I, I, you can have the rest, but this one's mine. And today is the day to repent. Say, God, you got it all. God, it's all yours because you're worthy. Maybe for you, you're like that third tragic type of soil. You believe in God, genuine faith. The only thing that's holding you back in your life is all of the clutter. And you're chasing after 10,000 things. And you're forfeiting the thing that matters the most. So today... The church of Jesus Christ, my hope, is if we look forward to the coming of our Savior Jesus, 
the second coming of Christ, that we can look forward to that day with confidence that we've prepared ourselves, that we've walked in repentance as